fucking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your round three recap for this week's Farmers Insurance Open. Joining me to break down the chaos is Greg Ducharme. Hello, Greg. Hey, hello, Rick. Well, uh, let me tell you one thing. We are not in Palm Springs anymore. <laughs> this is a big boy golf course, and it, it showed all of its teeth today. Uh, yeah, before we jump in, jump into this, the, the South course played a stroke and a half over par, by far the most difficult of the week that it's played. What I love about it, Greg, is the margins are small, buddy. You know, I mean, uh, being a, a yard into the rough is a big deal. We'll talk about what can happen on 18 here in a second. But, you know, two under, great score. Uh, two over, not so bad. That's only like, that's only a four shot difference. Like, it's just so tight how this course just kind of, makes you go on runs. Yeah. And you know, there's a couple things to it. It is par 72. So you got four par fives, but if you miss those fairways and you hit it a foot in the rough or hit it into those bunkers, you end up with some really diff, they become difficult holes. Uh, and, and you see guys make sixes or worse on the par fives. They are far from gimme birdies. Uh, and, and that, really increases the challenge. And then, you know, we had some of that sunshine creep out today, which took out some of the softness, but we still have really, really thick and juicy rough. Um, and I, I was listening to Thomas Dietrich in his post round press conference. He was asked about why the golf course played so much more difficult today. And he talked about the whole, a lot of back hole locations which adds length, length to the golf course. But also on the shorter holes, when you're coming in with wedges, it's really difficult to control spin. Um, that would be, uh, that's kind of an ironic statement coming from him. I won't give it away. We'll get to that later. But um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a hard golf course. Well, on the short holes, it's difficult. Uh, and on the long holes and even the par fives, it's, it's difficult to score. Well, I mean, let's just let's just do it, right? We would normally kind of ease our way into this, but it was just an absolute chaotic finish for the vast majority of the day. We were four wide. Steven Yeager, Matthew Pavon, Nikolai Hoygaard, Thomas Dietrich, four international golfers vying for victory. And it looked like, Greg, that Thomas Dietrich was going to be our overnight leader. We can look at his scorecard right now. And he stepped on the 18th tee uh, at... Let's see. He stepped there at 11 under. Yes. Thank you. Pipes one uh, on the left, left-hand side of the fairway, lays it up to wedge distance and then disaster strikes that spin control hits a wedge to the back portion of the green that rips and it rips completely down the green, down the front of the green and into the water eventually leading to a double bogey. This is so frustrating. I mean, before he hits this wedge shot, it's it's the drive of the day on the broadcast, right? and he yeah. decides not to go for it. He said he had a little bit of mud on the ball, wasn't quite comfortable with the lie, starting to get dark. It was getting a little colder out there. Uh, and even though he smashed that tee shot, it didn't quite carry as far as it normally would. So perhaps he felt you know, um, distance getting it there was an issue, which is obviously a problem. You can't come up short here, but this comes into play every single year at Torrey Pines, which is why this is a great hole because it's long enough where going for it is not guaranteed. So it brings the layup decision into play. And then you end up with a, with a backstop when, with your wedge shot. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Because you get you landed in the wrong spot on the green, and all of a sudden, just a little bit of spin turns into um, a, a lot of backward momentum toward the water, and that's exactly what happened to Dietrich. But you know that Rick, that wasn't the only unfortunate situation that happened for him during this round. He found a uh, a sprinkler head. Yes, on on eleven, uh, he there's a sprinkler head. What two feet off the green, as sprinkler heads usually are. Yep. So, flies it onto a sprinkler head and it flies another 25 yards over the green on 11, which is already a hard enough par three. You don't need that stuff happening. To no, you. that was brutal. Hey, and then, so he makes bogey there. And then at 12, he misses the fairway. This is the perfect example of miss the fairway by a foot. And 12 is like a 
five hundred and well, let's see what it was playing five eleven today. Yes. Hits it a foot into the rough. Has two twenty seven left. <sighs> I mean, you barely missed the fairway and you're laying up. This is U.S. Open style. Um, and now that's going to happen at Torrey Pines from time to time. But you can't have that kind of mistake and the bad breaks and the lack of spin control or w whether it was spin control or where he landed it. You know, there's a there's obviously a mistake on that wedge shot on 18. And those things com combining together they lead to a one over par 73 for him. Final 10 holes. Bogey on a par five. Birdie, bogey, bogey, birdie, bogey, par, birdie, par, double. So oh, killer. And he played so well. He was swinging, he was swinging so well today. That was a really disappointing round. While all that was happening, Steven Yeager finds the right rough on 18, lays it up to the right rough on 18. Probably a good thing because he gets, you know, not as much spin coming out of that stuff. He's able to, to knock one uh, in there tight to five feet, 10 inches. He makes a birdie. And all of a sudden, that is a three shot swing from Dietrich to Jaeger. And it is Steven Jaeger who will go to sleep tonight with the lead at the Farmers Insurance Open. We've spent a lot of time talking about Steven Jaeger. On, on the first cut podcast here, Rick. You know what we always ask, Greg? What do we always ask about Steven Yeager? What's the ceiling? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right? What's the ceiling? Are we getting but an answer? <laughs> I think we're getting an answer. It, it turns out, or so it seems, and I think this is fair to say regardless of what happens tomorrow, the performance started to improve. The results were lagging behind. Right? So the, the question that, we talked about it for, it seems like every Monday since the fall was why are Steven Yeager's results not matching up to the statistics? Why are they not matching up to all the green that we see in every single strokes gain column on rickrungood.com? He is, I mean, I mean, I, I made some notes last night about this. Um, he has gained strokes off the tee in 14 of 17 events, eight out of his last 12 approaching the green, 15 out of his last 16 around the green. This, this is phenomenal stuff. And the putting has been some good, some bad. It hasn't been quite as consistent as the rest, but it hasn't. It, it's not like when he puts bad, he finishes poorly. He It doesn't really matter. He just finishes T18. Um, but all of a sudden we see him in the mix for the first time. And all that work that he's put in to change his game is starting to pay off. And it, today was not a great day for him, but... He, he didn't drive it nearly as well as he did the first two days, but he's still hanging around and he's, he's right in the mix in this thing. This was a gritty day. Uh, some great short game shots. He was fifth in strokes gain around the green today. Um, and, and I'm really excited to see what Steven Yeager does tomorrow. I am so on the fence about this because he, uh, I, I believe that winning transcends Right, he he's won six times on the Corn Ferry Tour. It's tied for the 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 most ever on that circuit. I think that hey, you get a little lucky where you don't play your best stuff and you are you you, you steal the lead on on Friday night. Awesome, but I saw a couple of putts on the the second half of that round where those you know five to ten footers on Poana. Um, I I am worried about that. He's going to be in the final group again tomorrow. It, I worry. I worry about it. Uh, there's good reason for worry. But um, I do think that... And, and look, this this is the hard thing about Steven Yeager's position and what he's been doing. We don't get to hear from him a lot. Right? He hasn't gotten in the mix enough to where he's getting interviewed after rounds regularly. Um, so we don't really know what's going on behind the curtain. But this week, it's kind of come out that he's made some real significant changes to his game, made some real significant changes to his driving, which we've seen in the statistics. But hearing him talk about it and as optimistic as he is about that, he sounds like he's in a really good place in the interviews. So I understand where you're coming from, but um, but it's not like he got this lead with a 61 and it's going to peter off tomorrow. 
he can still go out there, grind this thing out, and an even par round may be good enough tomorrow, which I think bodes in, in his favor. The other two that we haven't discussed are Matthew Pavon and Nikolai Hoygaard. So we've got Jaeger in at 11 under. We've got Dietrich at 9. The two guys in the middle, 10 under par, are those two. Let's start with Matthew Pavon, who is uh, – Followed up his, his second round 65 with a third round 72. Compared to some of these other scorecards, this was boring. Now, it was three birdies, three bogeys. He played his final six holes at, at even par. Pars on all of them. Um, you said even par might do it. Uh, he might have to shoot one under or two under compared to where he, where he's at. But what did you think about uh, Matthew today? Well, one, I've been impressed with him all year. I was really impressed with him at the Sony Open. Uh, earlier this year, uh, he's gotten himself onto the PGA Tour through the DP World Tour, finishing in the top 10 there. And for a long time, I've worried about guys coming from the DP World Tour to the PGA Tour. They've had, you know, very mixed results, sometimes poor results. Uh, but for Matthew Pavan, they're matching up. He's come up right out and um, and come onto this tour in full stride the way he left off on the DP World Tour. So I, I like what he's done so far this year. And in today's round, the, the one thing heading into tomorrow is he did a lot of work on the greens. Uh, he made a lot of really nice putts today. The, the ball striking was a little scrappy at times. Um, you know, he only hit 10 greens of regulation. He only hit four fairways. Yeah, That is... Now, I'm like you with Jaeger. I'm a little on the fence with this <laughs> because there's an element to Torrey Pines where you just got to scrap it out. So that can ha you just you have to do that at some point. Um, but making this lot shooting 72 with those kind of numbers is going to be really hard to do again tomorrow. So he's going to have to find a way to get the ball and play a lot more than four times. He's going to need to follow the Mark Leishman. Yeah. Read. Yeah. Like like that scrappy way around. Right. Yeah, was Mark Leishman did hit three fairways in the final round. That's the, I cannot that. I mean, that's you're not supposed to do that. He broke it. Like you're not supposed to do that and win. No, but it it did seem that was before COVID. Yeah, I believe that was actually in 2020. It, um, yeah, it was. It was the. It was because it was the Kobe year. So, it felt like, as I watch this tournament, it doesn't feel like there's those trampled down lies anywhere. Where when Mark Leishman won, there was a lot of times where he'd miss big. And he kind of drew an okay lie. It feels like this year, no matter where you hit it, it is nasty, juicy. So yeah. I, I think we're looking at a different golf course than we had in the Mark Leishman year. So I was, I'll be down there again tomorrow and, uh, and Sunday actually. But, um, when I was there on Wednesday, I mean, it was thick and nasty and there was no hot. If you were in the rough, there's no hiding. Like you're just screwed. Yeah. You, I mean, and then you combine the length with it. I mean, guys that can hit some pretty good shots if, when they're 120 yards away. But when you start getting into the seven irons out of there, uh, so like that 190 range, which is pretty common out here, it, I mean, there it's a layup, right? You don't know, you, you lose total control. Sometimes it comes out just totally dead. Um, so yeah, it's you got to get the ball in play. The final of the Fab Four is Nikolai Hoygaard, who had a turbulent start, Greg. He, he made bogey on two and three. He then began to right the ship. He got it back to even for the round after a birdie on 13, but a reverse bounce back bogey on 14. He did make a good, what was that, 17, where he made a 13-footer, uh, right? 30, yeah, 13 footer to save par on 17. I thought was pretty big. He will enter the final round one shot back. Yeah, this was a another kind of gritty round at a Hoy guard. Uh, I had thought heading into today, he was one of the few guys that could kind of handle hitting it in the rough a little bit. But I, I think we even saw out of him today, it was still very difficult. He only hit five fairways today and it, he was able to hit 12 greens. But he does have a lot of speed. I think his game can't compete out here. But boy, he was hitting some shots with a lot of curve on him. Some big old draws. 
today, which there's a lot of favorable shots out here for draws, but there just seemed to be a lot of movement on his golf ball. Um, and this is the other thing, you know, he came into this tournament without seeing the golf course. He played nine holes on the North course in preparation and he goes out and shoots the round of the day on Thursday when he shoots 67. And there's something about playing a course for the first time when it kind of, you play well and it kind of fits, but you're looking around saying, Oh, if I hitting it there, it wouldn't be very good. Oh, Oh, oh okay. The whole location's accessible. Oh, but now it's tucked. Now what do I do? Oh, wow. This is a terrible lot. And, and so it gets more difficult uh, in those early stages. So I wonder if his experience will come into play or lack of experience will come into play tomorrow. But I thought he fought really hard in this round and kept himself in the mix. We're going to continue this conversation, talk about some of the chasers, and we will look at the odds heading into the final rounds of the Farmers Insurance Open. But first, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. We need your sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. And we're back. Okay, Greg, I just want to hit a couple of notables and then we'll loop back to the top of the board look at the odds and we'll we'll get out of here uh will zala Torres, back to back 68 but this time it's tied for the round of the day he is up 54 spots five birdies one bogey on the card he's wondering he's wondering what the problem these guys were having out there because this was pretty good vintage zala Torres. it was vintage zala Torres. This is what he does in major championships. I'm thrilled about this round today. He missed, I believe uh, it was two birdie putts inside of 10 feet today, uh, but made a couple of longer ones. But what he does so well on these difficult setups is just play really smart. He doesn't get himself in these terrible situations. Uh, he, uh, he hit 16 greens today. Right. I mean, that led the, the, the field average today was 62 percent. He had 62 green or 16 greens today. That's because he's positioning the ball in the right place. Um, and all of a sudden, a couple putts fall, a couple things go. You hit a couple close and all of a sudden you shoot four under and jump way up the leaderboard because he knows how to avoid mistakes. So, you know, I, I love his strategy on hard courses traditionally. Wasn't sure if his golf swing would be able to produce what he saw in his mind. And it's clear today that it it does. So, yeah, the stock on Will Zalatoris has skyrocketed for me in one round. In there just are, one round of golf. There are many guys lurking. I want to point out Ludwig Oberg here because I want to read you just a couple of putts that he has missed in the last two rounds. Just, just the last 36 holes. Yeah. He has missed putts of one foot, 10 inches, two feet, nine inches, three feet, three feet, seven inches, and four feet, eight inches. That is five putts in 36 holes inside four feet, eight inches. And he is four shots off the lead. I believe only two of those were today. Yes. Three um, of them were on back-to-back -back holes yesterday. Right. On 13 and 14. So... Now there's a couple sides. I don't remember this being an issue for Ludwig at any point so far in his career. Career is young. Um, we're at Torrey Pines. This is probably the hardest golf course uh, for short putting on the PGA Tour. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a little bit of a pass I can give him. One of those putts was a tap in. He missed. He probably should have taken more time over. You know, so you could kind of reason your way through things but i i think the point that you're trying to get at here is that he's only four shots off the lead <laughs> my, yeah my point is like how many is he gonna win by right like this is so terrifying so he he's coughed up all those strokes putting he is still gaining a stroke and a half putting over two rounds he is still four shots back Th this is this should be 
terrifying. He might not win this week, but this should be terrifying for everybody when you don't have, there are so many guys on the PGA tour that require their a plus plus stuff to win. Ludwig does not. This is scary. Well, he's also one of the guys that can go shoot 65 tomorrow. And there's not many in the field who can do that. I mean, that are in contention anyway. He could go shoot 65. Uh, and that might win by four to, to tomorrow's round. So, it, yeah, it, it is scary. It is really impressive. Um, I, I thought he put it a lot better today. There were a couple misses. But again, I it, it wasn't like the yesterday seemed like a meltdown which is why it draws so much attention, right? He's not late on the broadcast. Everybody sees it. It's a big deal. But um, but this golf course should be perfect for Ludwig. Uh, and, and it's nice for us to see him in contention, but it's not nice for uh, any of the leaders, anybody we've already talked about, anybody on this leaderboard. You don't want to see him there because he could pound fairways at 320 yards and make a ton of birdies on a golf course where it just doesn't seem possible. Oh boy, he is super, super dangerous. Okay, well, um, let's let's think about this. So last year, Max Homa uh, came back from five shots to win after 54 holes. Five shots would be anybody who is six under or better. That is 26 golfers on the leaderboard. You look at the odds. Greg, Steven Yeager is the favorite, plus 275. Nikolai Hoygaard, 4-1. to one. Matthew Pavon, 7-1. to one. Both Dietrich and Xander Shoffley. Xander Shoffley's four shots back are 14-1. to one. Uh, Ludwig is 20-1. to one. Tony Finau, 22. The door is wide open, bud. It, doesn't this just feel like it? I, I'm watching today say uh, Xander has a birdie putt on 18. He's at six under. He's got like eight feet. And I'm saying to myself, Xander's going to win. This couldn't be more perfect for him. Somebody's going to mess up on 18 in the final group. I, I thought the lead was going to be 10 and Xander was going to be three back. Me too. I thought and as well. yeah. look at what Xander did today. I mean, he also, like Will Zalatoris, hit 16 greens of regulation today. Uh, I'm sorry, he had 14 greens. Uh, but Xander made one birdie or two birdies one, and two bogeys shot even par nothing happened he lost two shots putting no, he made nothing i watched xander last week on sunday make everything it, he couldn't be in a better position he's he's close enough to the lead where he'll be freewheeling which is right where he wants to be um he's he's swinging beautifully He's hitting it well enough to win. It seems like every round has been a letdown so far. Not because of missed short putts or silly mistakes, but like he hasn't shot the scores that he's... His scores haven't matched how well he's played. And I think that could change tomorrow. So, I mean, I'm, I'm circling Xander's name twice on this. I feel like he's going to come from behind and charge and win. We're going to need more cameras because this is, we're going to be like 26 wide for 18 holes. Um, I think, yeah. I, I think, God, I don't love the number because there's so many guys in there, but I, I, I'm a big believer in Hoygaard. I'm a big, I'm a big, but just in general. And I think that he's really good. Yeah, he's really good. And I think there's a lot more juice to squeeze out of that. I mean, we didn't even talk about like Pendrith is three back on a course that should fit in pretty well. And he's 22 to one. Pendrith started on 10 today and struggled. That back nine's just so hard. Yeah. But he made the turn and hit like four shots in six holes inside of five feet. He just started flagging it on the front nine. Uh, and that's why he nearly shot the round of the day. I have literally no idea who's going to win. It's a it's a tough call because I could see this final group kind of lingering around, being in contention, and one of them winning. Um, but I could also see uh, with Xander, with Ludwig. I mean, Max Homa is is outside his mark from last year, but he's at five under par. Mm -hmm. 
could see him making a little move. He's got to hit it a little better. But um, yeah, there's there's a lot of guy. Tony Finau didn't play. I mean, made a couple mistakes today. Played pretty well. Hit it into the barrage. What do you call that? The the crevice. Oh, the, the, yeah, the canyon. I don't the know. Canyon. That. Yeah, <laughs> canyon twice. So and missed a couple short putt. Had two three putts. Hit it in the canyon twice. Taylor Montgomery is all of a sudden like a ball striker. It's a tough one to predict. I, I, but I, I think Xander's the guy. As, I, as I've watched this tournament, he looks like the the guy who's playing the best. All right, so let's just do this real quick off the top of our head. Steven Yeager zero PGA Tour wins, right? Zero. Yes. Six. Corn Ferry. Pavon zero. Zero. Hoygaard zero, but a European Tour win. Yep. Dietry zero. That's correct. Hendrith zero. Correct. Trace Crow, Jake Knapp, zero, zero. Taylor Montgomery, zero. Joe Highsmith, zero. Robbie Shelton, zero. Parker, Parker zero. Zero. Ludwig, one. One. McNeely, zero. Zero. Okay, then we get to Xander. With what? Seven or eight? I, no, I don't know. It depends on what you're counting. But that is, I mean... Like the first 10 guys on the leaderboard and at least half of the guys inside the top 18. I mean, Ryan Brem, zero. Like ha- oh, no, Ryan guess- Brem has one. one. Yeah. Like uh, yeah, the Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico open. Yeah. But, but like, uh, it's not a lot. <laughs> no. Will Zalatoris won. <laughs> you know? Look, this is the thing. Somebody, somebody in that group is going to play well. I, I believe Xander plays well, but there's enough guys. It's bunched enough where there's a really good chance you get a first time winner. If it's not Xander, my second choice would be Jaeger. All right. Well, listen, I know it makes you nervous, I but am- this is an emotional thing for me. Stay, stay close to a television because it's, it, I, I think it's going to be crazy. I don't think anybody's going to run away with it. I think it's going to be pretty crazy over the course of uh, all Saturday long. We will be back after the final putt drops to break it all down, no matter who that champion is. Uh, for now, big thanks. Producer Mike does all the hard work behind the scenes. That's Greg Ducharme. You can find him on Twitter at the Real GFD, and you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut. We'll catch you next time.